Good morning. We are in 1 Timothy, still beginning our introduction to 1 Timothy. We're going to be talking about some of the heresies that are going to be dealt with in Ephesus when Paul's leaving Timothy there. But also, uh, we're going to go back and finish up what takes place in that second journey, the second missionary trip, when Paul actually spends three years in Ephesus, sets the stage for the church, goes over to Corinth, visits that, and then comes back and has a prophecy for the church of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, predicting this is exactly where they're going to be. Now, Paul is writing to Timothy in 62 A.D., Uh, Uh, He's just been released from prison and is going to be uh, going on some other missionary trips, possibly going to Spain, leaving Timothy in Ephesus with a church that he started sometime in 54 A.D. He was there for three years, teaching daily, also had a job, was also working uh, daily in the the city of Ephesus. I'm going to show you where that took place. In fact, we've got a map right here we're going to be looking at. Uh, that's going to be kind of, I think, interesting as far as the details of the city. Amazing what we can find out about the city and the culture. I mean, there's Greek writers writing, Roman writers writing at that time, talking about the, the, the culture. Uh, we got archaeology. Plus, you've got church historians recording what had taken place. You got the book of Acts. You've got boots on the ground in the book of Acts. You got Paul writing a letter to the Ephesians, a letter to Timothy while he's in Ephesus. And also possibly, not possibly, but 2 Timothy is also while he's in Ephesus. So we've got a lot of details. It's pretty clear what's going on there. Uh, I'll say pretty clear. Uh, We know it deals with heresy. Now, some people will talk about 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and the book of Titus as being uh, the pastoral epistles, uh, giving directions to church leadership on how to set up a church. That's fun. That's fair. Uh, There's information on how to run a church there. But we're going to see as we breeze through this today, and we'll teach verse by verse through 1 Timothy, that the issue is heresy within the church, that there are teachers in the church that need to be taken out of the church. Now, this is there's two levels. You're going to have the culture, the cultural level, and that culture in Ephesus during the days of Paul and Timothy, you know, 54 to 56 A.D., when Paul stops by in 57 A.D. on his way back to Jerusalem, and when he writes in 62 A.D. Now realize, this is only eight years. It's not like a long span of time. The church starts in 54 A.D. Well, okay, that's when Paul arrives. Aquila and Priscilla had been working there previously, uh, say like 52 AD. But nonetheless, we've got a 10-year span of Christianity in Ephesus when Timothy receives this letter of 1 Timothy saying heresy needs to stop. So again, keep that in mind. We're not talking about you know 50 years or 100 years or a, what we may even consider in the Western world a, a long-established church. This is a an upstart church yet, even in 62 AD, if we look at it in our, our terms, our idea. There is problems with the culture, and we'll talk about that here today as we go through things. Uh, there's, there's Artemis worship, there's Isis worship combined with Artemis worship, there's uh, 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 emperor worship, there's a temple to Julius Caesar, there's a temple to the, the goddess, his wife, there's a temple that's going to be built to Hadrian later on. So there's Uh, Roman emperor worship. There's Artemis worship. There's also, as we saw last week, looking at Acts chapter 19, there's a Jewish influence. Now, this should be a positive influence because uh, of the foundation of the Old Testament, the foundation of the prophets, the foundation of the plan of God, of where where, uh, uh, creation came from, where man came from, the orders that God established. It should be positive. And in the sense of Old Testament scripture, uh, it is positive. But we see that this Judaism or the Jewish culture in Ephesus as throughout the Middle East at that time had branched off into several things. You're going to have uh, a magical element that we already saw uh, last week in Acts. You're going to have the, the element that's going to become very legalistic. And of course they are salvation you know, through the Mosaic Law or fellowship with God by obeying the law. And as the Jews come into the faith or Christianity expands and of course Paul's Jewish uh, there's people that in Paul's ministry that are Jewish you know Barnabas Mark and many and, and the apostles come out of Jerusalem they're going to be preaching to Jews but many of the Jews are not going to make the the break that Paul is talking about of 
salvation by faith in Christ. They may recognize Christ, but there's no, and again, we can understand this if we're sympathetic, there's no way for them to break off of their, their obedience to the Mosaic law, which keeps them in fellowship with God, which is a sign that they are the covenant people. And then here comes Christ that they've been waiting for, the Messiah. They receive him. It's hard for them to say, well, we're, gonna, we're not going to have to obey the law for right standing with God. Paul's point is we're justified by faith in Christ and that alone. The Jews will say, okay, we believe in Christ, but we've got to have legalistic action also or obey the law of Moses, which, of course, is going to become a huge problem. It's already been a problem in the book of Galatians. Combine that with coming out of Alexandria down in Egypt, uh, the philosophy of Philo and others, but you've got Greek philosophy now meeting Jewish philosophy in Egypt, in Alexandria, Egypt, and you've got this looking at the way they used to read Homer and the Greek legends, uh, they didn't necessarily believe them as historical, although they did, but they looked for, at, looked in at, for meaning, like what's the story behind the story? What's written between the lines? So you've got this historical account or this poetic account by Homer, but what is the meaning? They then took that ideal of Greek philosophy or Greek reading of literature and brought it into the Old Testament. Okay, you've got Adam and Eve in the garden. You've got Noah on a boat. You've got Abraham leaving Ur. You've got Moses with the children of Israel in the wilderness. Right, it's not so much history as it is what's going on behind. And then you hit the genealogies. Oh, can you have fun with the genealogies? Name after name after name. Who begat who? But then also those names also have meaning. And you take the meaning out of the names. Oh, this means whatever. Who gave birth to this meaning. And now you've got a story within the story in the genealogy that becomes what we call, going to be called myths. Myths. It, it's not true. You're making this stuff up. You're being creative. It's like an artistic license with poetry. Now, if you want to read a poem and have what that poem means to you, that, that's fine. It makes me feel this way. We listen to music that way. It makes me feel this way. It makes me remember this. That's, that's, our, that's an artistic expression. But when you're looking at documents, when you're looking at historical documents, when you're looking at doctrinal information that builds your faith, that describes God, describes creation, uh, you can't go behind the scene and start, oh, well, maybe this means this, and getting creative. And that leads to not just Jewish uh, magic that was involved here or legalism that leads to Jewish mysticism where they're going to be able to tell stories behind and Paul is going to have to confront that in Ephesus and throughout his ministry he's going to have to confront culture which is not necessarily the issue in the book of Timothy as much as the culture that has come into the church and is now producing heresy we've got to mention eventually Gnostics or Gnosticism, uh, which we will today. Gnostics is that Greek philosophy that is going to have to take anything it can and try to explain where everything came from. And they're going to go into uh, the, the original God, and then from that original God, there was also these like angelic beings called eons, or what, all ages, or different levels of, of personalities, spiritual powers. And there's going to be uh, one of the ages, the eons, that is going to break off and create the world. Now, this was not what God wanted. Now, this is Gnostic, and, and again, it's developing. It's not a hard, uh, solid religion or philosophy as much as is, is a, a moving, rolling development, almost like, like Plato rolling across the Middle East, starting in, in uh, uh, Persia uh, in the east, and just keeps rolling, and whatever it picks up in a religion it just rolls it into the plato so by the time it gets to ephesus and keeps rolling on into rome it just co keeps collecting different points of religion and now he hits christianity adapts that religion re readjusts the names and it's like what what the, the gnosticism that you have in 50 a.d is not the same but a developed gnosticism of 150 a.d developed by 250 a.d it just keeps rolling like plato through all these religions picking up more terms and trying to explain it's full of contradictions when you just keep combining religion after religion eventually the ideas collide and it makes no sense and paul's going to be addressing timothy about contradictions 
that are in religion. And that is going to be part of this Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is a big deal here uh, developing in Ephesus, and we'll, we'll talk about that. I think the book of 1 Timothy is about these heresies. With that being said, I want to read just, well, let's do this. I'll, I'll read 1 Timothy. I will read, yeah, I read all of 1 Timothy. That's probably what we should do. I will read the first lines of 1 Timothy. And then I want to introduce you to the notes that we have available here today. Here's 1 Timothy. And again, as we read this, throughout the, again, you, you know, you've you got to think on your own. You've got to be making your own decisions. But I'm suggesting that with this background, the heresy, the culture, uh, and the idea that they've got false teaching that is twisting the Creator God into something evil or creating a creator God that's different than the supreme God, and that the supreme God, which we would call Yahweh, or God the Father, is at war with the creator God, which is this other lower being that doesn't even know the supreme God exists, and they're at war with each other, and now we've got people that were created by a, a bad God, and now we're trying to bring the pe people back to the supreme God, and no one understands. It's all crazy mysticism coming out of Gnosticism that whenever Paul writes here to Timothy, uh, we have in church history, we have what we call the creeds, like the Apostolic Creed or the Apostles' Creed, or the Nicene Creed, and we'll get into those on Monday night. We've got a great study coming up on Monday night. It's going to pick up on this very idea. Uh, but those creeds are sometimes boring. You read them in church. Sometimes I remember as a kid reading them in church. is like blah, 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 blah. But those were statements of faith that this is true. There is one God. There is one creator God. And Jesus is God who became a man who died physically on a cross. And they go on and they establish these things. It's like, well, why are we doing this? Well, Paul is doing the same thing in 1 Timothy many times, is making these almost boring, basic statements because the heretics have completely twisted the idea of a creator God who is the good God, the, the God who is the Savior. The creator God in Gnosticism was a, a rebellious angel that created the, the world. I mean, the whole world was a creation of a rebellious angel. So the whole world is evil, but yet the supreme God sent his light into it, chose an individual man named Jesus who wasn't God but was a man who's now going to have the information about the supreme God that no one knows about in the world and even the angels don't know about. And again, we're talking Gnosticism here. And they try to explain Christianity. And all of that is contradictions within itself and definitely with the Scripture. So when Paul writes to Timothy, he's going to be making these statements that are, in a sense, statements of faith that you've got to hold on to that are contra contradicting what he's combating in Ephesus. But notice how he begins. Here we go. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Right there, the, the apostle comes from the, the same person, the same place. God, who is our Savior, and Jesus, who is our hope. And both of them are in agreement that Paul is the spokesperson. He's writing to Timothy, my true son, in the faith. And so Timothy is in agreement with Paul in this faith. Now he says, grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. There it is, God the Father, Christ Jesus is Lord, and Christ Jesus Lord, three terms, Christ Messiah, Jesus, human man, Lord is the Savior, is God. So you've got the Creator, who's a man, who is God, who is the Lord, the Messiah, who's united with the Father. Now, verse 3. Watch this verse right here. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, Paul is going further northwest into Macedonia. He told Timothy, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrine. The point of this book, the point of this book is, Timothy, the reason I left you there was that you need to go through the churches and start shutting down teachers that are teaching false doctrine. We're not worried about the temple of Artemis. That's another problem. We're not worried about the temple to Caesar and emperor worship. We're not worried about all those things in the culture, although they are impacting the church because people are coming. People are not coming out of a Christian culture into the Christian church. They're coming out of the Ephesian culture and becoming Christians. So they are bringing with those cultural experiences and expectations into the church, which is going to be addressed in the book. But Paul's issue, and leaving Timothy there, is that within the church that is already established over these last 10 years, 
certain men need to be commanded commanded stop teaching uh false doctrines any longer nor to devote themselves and watch this nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies now we don't that's why this is important this background information because when was the last time you went to a church or you went to a Bible study and they start talking about myths and endless genealogies in a, in, a, in a corrupt way? It's like, well, you know, you can make, you can answer that question however you want to. But what he was talking about, we would assume, as we do some study, is the myths and endless genealogies are coming out of the Alexandrian school of thought. That's where Apollos came from. And remember, he came up to Ephesus, met Aquila and Priscilla. He was a Christian, but they instructed him in a more better way of Christianity and corrected his doctrine and released him as the teacher in Ephesus and he eventually goes to Corinth as a teacher. But he would have came possibly came out of that school of Greek philosophy, of Jewish background, being in a Jewish setting, but also having embraced Christ and all of it having been explained in a mystical, uh, with myths and genealogies, and was basically off track and had to be corrected. Now again, not a heretic, just in need of correction. But nonetheless, they devote themselves to endless myths and, and genealogy, or myths and endless genealogies. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. Now, these endless myth, myths and endless genealogies and the things that are not sound doctrine, he says they, <coughs> they promote a controversies because now you're going to have people coming together and you've got choices. And once you go into the mystical, behind-the-scene interpretation of Scripture, like this name means this and this means that, and so that means this would have happened, it's like you're making it up. Well, someone else is going to interpret it, and they're going to say, well, this means this, and that means this, and now the conclusion is this is the doctrine. There's going to be conflicts. There's going to be controversies. There's no, no place that you can go and say this is what we unify in. This is what we believe. This is the doctrine. So again, he's trying to preserve the unity of the faith, which is, again, the focus that we all believe in Christ, and this is the definition of Christ. This is the work that Christ has done. Our faith is here, and we are now united, and we maintain the peace of this unity because we hold these doctrines. But once someone brings in choices, now watch, that's exactly what this word heresy means. We're going to get into that on Monday nights. Heresy means choices. It, and again, choices, again, when I present something, sometimes I, can, I, I look at the scripture and I'll say, well, it, this could mean this and this could mean this, or there's a chance that some people explain it this way. We're not sure. I tend to think this is true, but you do have, in a sense, three choices or two choices on how to interpret this, and this is the where they go. Now, some of those things we're, we're still learning, or individually, I'm still figuring some things out in the scriptures. But some things are solid, that if you deviate from here, you change Christianity entirely. If you add legalism, that you have to obey the law of Moses to be saved, that's no longer Christianity. If you separate God the Creator from Jesus Christ, and God the Creator is a fallen being, and Jesus Christ is the being of light from the original supreme being, and that all of creation is evil... Paul's going to talk to Timothy about that. And that's what Gnostics believe. All of creation, everything physical is evil, and so you need to separate from it. Well, in Christianity, God created all. And if you remember the seven days, this is why it's important. This is why it's important, the seven days of creation. And he saw that it was good. He did this and saw that it was good. He did this and saw that it was good. It was all said and done. He goes, it is very good. So in Christianity, the physical world is good. In fact, when it's under God's rulership, it's very good. It becomes evil when you add rebellion to it, and then you've got the story of the fall of man, and now man can take anything that is good and twist it into corruption or rebellion. So now, God, Paul is going to point out to Timothy that the physical world is very good, but that would be a choice, a heresy. Is the created world good? Or is the created world bad by its very nature? Biblically, Christianity, you can't argue with this. One of the things I'll say, you cannot argue with this Christian doctrine. God created the world. It is good. And when under God's rulership, God's leadership, it is very good. Now, 
Are there bad things in the earth? Yes. Is there rebellion? Yes. Is there sin? Yes. And that's another conversation. Where did that come from? That's another conversation. But if you were to say, I would say, if a person were to introduce to the church, the physical world is evil, the body of man is evil, everything in creation is evil, we need to go to a spiritual perfection and find this mystical place to find purity and, and goodness uh no that, that, that's not christian well yeah but that's what our church believes that's what we teach in our bible study and we believe god this and jesus it's like that's not the right god that's not the right jesus that is a choice that is wrong that's a heresy and so that is what this book is dealing with now with that being said um Oh boy, I got a lot of things to cover today. Um, I want to introduce the three sets of notes that we have. They're online underneath the video feed on generationword.com. We've got, uh, first of all, we've got this set. It's called Heresy. That's actually today's notes, Heresy. We'll probably use those in the next few weeks also. It kind of comes, we're going to pick up with that in chapter 19 of Acts and finish some things there. Uh, that's the first set of notes that I'll introduce you to. Then we've got, I think, a great set of notes of images or pictures. And I think this is called images slash photos or map slash photos or something. Uh, that's this one right here. And that's this first picture. I'm very excited to go. I'm not sure how this is going to go, if you're going to like it or not. But I, it's, it's amazing, I think. And I'm going to shoot through that. And then I've got also an old set of notes from 2014 just on Acts chapter 19, that's also linked on there. Uh, it starts off with a great picture of uh, the Temple of Artemis, and a, a remodel, reconstruction of it. We'll talk about that. Um, with that being said, I'm going to go to Acts chapter 19, where we left off last week. So I'm going back to Acts <coughs> chapter 19, verse uh, 23. Um, and Paul has already come into this is we would pick this up on these notes right here on the, the very first notes the Ephesian heresy and that's the map the journey of the uh, his second missionary journey uh, it comes through it's on page two it talks about meeting the the uh, the Jews and the magicians and how remember they burnt thousands and thousands of dollars worth of magic scrolls because Paul had uh, done a miracle and and people were being healed because of paul teaching daily in tyrenius's lecture hall paul was working in the mornings apparently would teach during the lunch hour which was about a four hour break because of the heat of the day people would stop by 11 go back to work about three or four o'clock kind of different than our culture i mean if by four o'clock i'm done uh but uh that was their lunch they'd go back to work and work on in the cool of the evening uh, and they worked at a place called the uh, agora we'll show you that uh, but he would come and teach during that lunchtime, during that break, at, at Tyrannus' lecture hall. It appears Tyrannus had a, uh, a, a philosophical school that he would lecture in, and then when he was done and he would take a break for lunch, they would fill that up and possibly eat their lunches in there and listen to Paul e e explain Christianity. Uh, on page one of the, that set of notes, the Ephesian heresy at the bottom of page one, it talks about uh, some names of, of Tyrannus, uh, from 50 to 93 AD that have been found on inscriptions in Ephesus. There's one, two, three, four, five inscriptions found in Ephesus right there uh, during Paul's time in the New Testament time of a man named Tyrannus. So it's like, ah, that must be him. It could be one of them. It could be not be. But nonetheless, it's a popular name enough that five people with their names inscribed. I doubt my name's going to be on any inscriptions uh, in the remains of the Western civilization 2,000 years. But Tyrannius has uh, five times his name is inscribed, uh, but it's, it appears to be five different people. If that's the one, one of those is where Paul was using his lecture hall, it's possible, but it's possible it's not. We don't know that for sure. We just know that that name was used there. Uh, nonetheless, that's page one, page two. We've got some photos on page three. We're going to get a lot of photos. Um, uh, really, page five is very important, and I want to go through that, but I want to keep moving on this. But anyway, we're going to look in chapter 19 of Acts. After Paul had met uh, uh, with the, 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 the early believers in John the Baptist, he'd been in the synagogue, teaching in the synagogue 
for several weeks. They drove him out, and he, some went with him, like always. Some Jews went with him and accepted the gospel. And then he went and continued to take it to the Gentiles in Ephesus. So he's got a, a lecture hall with Jews that are there that have become believers, maybe Jews that are listening and analyzing it. Uh, you've got Gentiles there. Some of them are into Artemis worship. Some of them are into emperor worship. Some of them are becoming Christians but really don't understand all of it. So he's explaining daily. Now, Paul's preaching is having an effect on the Ephesian culture. Uh, there's the Temple of Artemis, and you can see that on what is called the, the Old Notes, the Temple of Artemis. And I'll show you where it's at on the map here in a little bit. It's up on a hill uh, to the north side of the city. It's got 127 pillars, 62 feet high. There's 13 steps coming up the temple. It is one of the uh, seven wonders of the ancient world. So it's a fantastic building. If you look on the front page of the old notes, you can see an image, but you can also see what remains of it today is just one pillar standing there. It has been destroyed. And again, a lot of Artemis worship is, is connected into the book of Timothy and in the book of Acts. Nonetheless, People would come from all around the world, the Mediterranean world, to worship Artemis. All the, the ladies, girls, females in the culture of Ephesus were, were dedicated to Artemis, and they would copy Artemis's dress and hairstyle, and they would all have her, you know, her, her hunting uh, ability, that they would practice these things. We'll talk more about that as we get into the book of 1 Timothy. So it was a big deal. Every house was affected by it. It would be similar to a, a fair connect connection. Would be every house in uh, the Western world celebrated some form of Christmas uh, a couple of weeks ago. Now, again, it may have been a little more religious than others, and some of it was just the holiday, but they all exchanged gifts. There was some level of a commitment to the holiday season. Uh, nobody wanted to go to work on Christmas or during the holidays. They wanted their holiday because we're, it's affected, it's in our culture. Now you can argue it different ways. It used to be more than others, nonetheless. It's still a reality. Artemis worship was in, in, entwined in their civilization, in, in Ephesus, more than in other places. Artemis was a reality all around the, the Greek world, Roman world at the time. Sometimes in the Roman, not sometimes, but in the Roman world, she is Diana coming out of Egypt. It was Isis, it was Artemis, a different, different name of the same type of goddess. Again, that's another whole fun conversation to get into. Uh, but understand, all the girls were dedicated to Artemis and, and her style of living. And that was the case. Um, but because Paul was there, again, for a couple years, three years, Paul has been there. Aquila and Priscilla have been there for a couple years before that. So the church is four or five years old. But because Paul was there, got kicked out of the synagogue, is now teaching daily in Tyrannus' lecture hall, it has affected the economy. People have stopped buying the silver trinkets or silver images uh, that they would buy from the silversmiths that were producing these. They'd, they'd buy them, they'd make a donation, or then they would end up taking it up to the temple and, and setting it up, or it'd represent, a lot of times, you know, I've been where in Mesopotamia, you've seen different museums, if, it, if the Oriental Museum in uh, Chicago or the British Museum, uh, they would put images in their temple of a person, and they try to make that image, you know, to represent themselves, so that in their understanding of God, whenever the God in the temple would look from wherever he was sitting there in the throne or his holy place or whatever, he would see, ah, an image of you. Now, you're busy working or you've gone back home, but ah, you're there. So they'd set images of, of themselves, and you can see these, especially in, from Mesopotamia, uh, from the days of Abraham, is it, very interesting, uh, but they have set similar things. They would set these images, if it be a donation, if it be a representation of themselves, or, you know, like in, in a lot of times in, in certain Christian groups, they light candles in memory of different people or whatever. Uh, they were doing something like that at Artemis. But because Paul was there, and people were meeting him in the lecture hall, and Christianity was spreading, uh, it began to affect the market. Here it is, chapter 19, verse 23. We are in the year 56 A.D., at the end of Paul's three years of being there, and Timothy's with him, and Paul's about to be driven out of town and head on into Macedonia and over to Corinth. During this whole time, he's been writing letters to the Corinthians. Timothy's been sent over to Corinth to solve a problem. Titus has gone over to Corinth and solve a problem just on the other side of the Aegean Sea. 
So Paul's been busy with the church in Ephesus, but also still writing letters, still sending people out to different churches. But now, in 56 AD, after his three years, about that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. So this is the term that the people used in, in Ephesus about Paul teaching the way. Uh, and we'd call it Christianity. But he was teaching the way, a great disturbance about the way, a silversmith named Demetrius. Uh, uh, a silversmith named, I got, just got a message. I wanted to see if it was someone saying where they couldn't hear us or anything. But no, no, it's just telling us there's caucus tomorrow. It's like, don't forget. <laughs> about that time, there arose a great disturbance in Ephesus about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius. Now, Demetrius' name is going to come up in 2 Timothy also, while Paul's in prison on his way to his execution. So it's possible this commotion is going to be the reason Paul is condemned by Nero and decapitated in 68 AD, maybe fall of 67, but spring of 68. He's, he is just, he's going to be getting out of prison in 62 AD because the Jews brought charges against him, but that's in Acts, and he's, he's released from that imprisonment that the book of Acts ends with because the Jews probably never showed up to bring charges. But these charges are going to follow him into uh, the 60s, and he's going to be in prison and executed, probably for this, what is considered a crime. But anyway, so Demetrius' name is going to continue to Paul's, until Paul's dead. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. Now the craftsmen, those are the artisans. They're going to be working at this, in this place called the Agora where all the businesses and shops were, probably where Paul worked also. But they're making these Artemis or the silversmiths are making trinkets or sh uh, images of Artemis that would be taken up to the Artemis temple or set in their homes or whatever they did with them. He called them together, the artisans, Demetrius, because the, the, the prophets are going to, the, the charge, you know, the, the prophets are, are collapsing. The, the culture's changing, and it's affecting the economy. He called them together along with the workmen in the related trades. The related trades would be, you know, the, those that had little shops that were selling them or those who shipped them to other parts of the country. They'd be the shippers and the, and the shopkeepers. Anyone who's connected to and their businesses was suffering. If they're not selling them, your shopkeepers are not making money, the shipping company's not making money, everything's being affected, the economy's sinking. Men, he says, you know, we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus. So that is Demetrius' words. We make a lot of money, but here in, by 56 AD, this guy Paul, who's teaching this new way, has led many people into this church type setting again the churches were meeting in homes they didn't have buildings at this time and people have stopped buying these trinkets or these shrines uh, has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in ephesus and in practically the whole province of asia in other words the damage has gone on into Colossae and Heropolis, laodicea all across asia he says that man-made gods are no gods at all there is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world will be robbed of her divine majesty. Three things. Our business is suffering, the temple is going to fall into disgrace, and Artemis is going to lose her place. And the idea there, they believe in Artemis. They, their whole world is based on Artemis blessing them. They do not want to make Artemis mad. We can get into more of this as we go through 1 Timothy. But they, they want to appease the goddess. Because if she gets upset, all bad things will begin to happen. And so it's business, it's the glory of the temple, and it's the fact that if she loses her honor here, uh, she may will move somewhere else with her glory, but we will be under judgment. And so don't do this. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now this is all because Paul is teaching daily in Tyrannus' lecture hall, and people are listening to him and are starting to follow his example, his teaching, and follow Christ. Soon the whole city was in an uproar, which is a big deal. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus. These are guys from Thessalonica. Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia and rushed as one man into the theater. I'm going to show you this theater. They were, it's a huge theater. 
seats like 25,000 people. But we'll talk about it. Rush into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd. Now, once you've got a, a, a 25,000 people chanting, greatest Artemis of the Ephesians, even some of Paul's companions have been drug in there. Paul says, hey, I've got a great idea. I'll go speak to the crowd that wants to execute me. Uh, but nonetheless, now watch this. Paul wanted to uh, appear before the crowd. This is great. This is a bigger crowd than I get at Tyrannus' lecture hall. I'll go speak there. But the disciples would not let him. The, the believer says, no, Paul, they're, going to, they're not going to listen to you. They want to lynch you. Yes, but I'll give me a chance to speak. And, and they, they prevented Paul from doing it. Now watch this, next verse, verse 31. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message. So Paul, and we'll talk about this, these, there's a technical, technical word here used in the Greek that's also found in inscriptions in Ephesus. These are the political leaders of a, of a certain class. They send Paul a, a text message, or in their day they would have wrote a note and sent a messenger with it down to Paul and gave him a note or sent a messenger to Paul says, Paul, don't leave, find some protection. These were the, the leaders of the city of Ephesus that are watching the whole thing develop, and they're friends of Paul. So that means some of the leadership, the, some of the political leaders, the Gentiles, have come over to Christianity during Paul's teaching in Tyrannus' lecture hall to the point that when this riot breaks out, they, they understand, they grew up with Artemis worship, and they understand the importance of the economy, and they understand the dynamics of what's going on, and, but they side, in a sense, with Paul, still trying to, they're going to have to somehow navigate their way through the political situation, but Paul, they're his friends, they say, don't go. So Paul had friends in high places by this time, within three years, in Ephesus. They sent a mess, him a message, begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most, like, like most riots, most of the people did not even know why they were there. They just got swept in the mob into the crowd, into the, uh, the halls of Congress on January 6th. They just got swept in there. The doors were open, so they all just go in. Oh, no, no, that's, that's a different story. Uh, the, the, most people did not know. They just got swept into the theater. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front, and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make, and Alexander would be one of the leaders there, uh, workers, and made a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So, I mean, nothing's getting done. They're just shouting. Now the city clerk quieted the crowd. Now, now someone, a polit politician comes in. One of the leaders of the city comes in, quiets the crowd. Now watch what he says to them. Men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image, which fell from heaven? Now we get some information there. One, this was the main center of Artemis worship. The whole world knows this, and they're not going to go anywhere else. And also, we're the ones that have this meteor that fell, and someone brought it in and says, it's, it looks like the image of Artemis. Apparently, some rock, some meteor fell out of the sky at some point in the past, and it looked like, if you squinted your eyes or looked at it from a certain angle, it looked like the image of Artemis herself, and she sent it to the Ephesians for their temple, apparently. Uh, that's what it says, that we have the image which fell from heaven. We have that. So it's like, you guys, listen, Artemis has given us her approval. We have her temple, the whole world. Paul is not going to leave a dent. That's his point. Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, these are their doctrines, these are our doctrines, they're undeniable, we have the stone that fell from Artemis, we have the temple that everyone comes to, these are undeniable, uh, you have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. Notice what he says, you have no charges against these, have there been logical, they're, and they're, they're concerned. The city clerk that's speaking to the mob right now is concerned because they are a Greek city, but who rules the world? The Roman Empire rules. They're under the rulership of, at this time, Caesar, which would be Nero. They're under Nero's authority. And if the Romans, and they've got a, a place, I'll show you the place of the uh, where the, the headquarters or the residence of the, of the Roman uh, governor is at, right there near the theater. If the Romans are displeased with, and Romans wanted one thing. They wanted peace. They didn't want conflict. And if you gave them conflict, they brought you war until they had peace. If you just agreed with them, they just move on. You can continue as Ephesians. You can continue as Greeks. 
We maybe set a temple up here so you can honor uh, the, the emperor as a god, but we'll move on, pay your taxes, and have a nice day. Well, these guys have started a riot in the city of Ephesus, right under the noses of the Romans. And it's like, if you do this, the Romans are going to say, uh, you're no longer a, a, a city on good standing. They will take the honors. They've got temples there. They're, a, uh, they're the, the, the capital of the area. They're a, a city that had Rome had recognized with special honor, special privileges. Rome will just take that all away if you're causing problems. And that's the point of the city clerk. And Ephesians saying, don't make the Romans mad. You've got a peace of life here because the Romans are happy with you. You do this, they're, they're not going to be happy. So here he goes. Um, you have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed or goddess. If they had robbed the temple of Artemis and stolen silver, we've got a case. We'll take it to court and win. If they had blasphemed Artemis, now again, that's amazing that Paul has come this far presenting Christianity to the Ephesians without having been accused of blaspheming Artemis. He can preach Christ without running Artemis in the ground. Preaching Christ will leave a big enough dent. Artemis will just, she'll just fade away. Once you have the glory of Christ. So that Paul's ministry was not tear down Artemis. His ministry was exalt Christ. So that they could say, uh, he has not, no, they haven't blasphemed Artemis. Because that would be a crime also. Robbing from the temple or blaspheming the goddess. Why would that be a crime? Because Artemis if she gets upset with the city, will punish the city. So if someone is being allowed to blaspheme her in the city, it will be a community uh, responsibility to deal with that person and punish them so Artemis knows we've taken care of it. Otherwise, you'll all be guilty. That's their logic. If then Demetrius, that's the guy who brought the start of the riot, the silversmith, who is going to follow up on this, he is going to follow up on this until it gets to Nero's court and Paul is executed in 68 A.D. He says, if then, if then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. If you've got a problem, the courts are open all day. Go down there, file your charges. There's proconsuls will look into it. They can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. Amazing, that word assembly is the word ecclesia which we get the word church from ecclesia. It's a Greek word. It means a legal assembly. It's where the citizens of a community, of the community of Ephesus, they gather together as a body to represent and take care of situations. It would be a, the gathering of the citizens. It's the ecclesia. He says, if you have another problem, form a legal assembly and discuss it. That is where the word church comes from, the ecclesia. Paul is forming the ecclesia, or Jesus Christ says, I will build my ecclesia. It's those citizens that are called out, citizens of God's kingdom, are called out. It can be universal, or it can be a local assembly of believers that have come together to take care of business, some kind of assembly. And again, that's just interesting. There's the word used, ecclesia, in its natural setting before it became a Christianized term. As it is, we are in danger, as you're doing this right now, here just starting a riot in the middle of the day, shutting down businesses. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting. Who's going to charge with rioting? The Romans. Because of today's events. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion. We can't say, well, here was the situation. We'd say, there was no paperwork. There was no reason. It was out of control. We lost control of our, of our civilization. And Rome will say, well, that won't happen again. And they'll bring guards in. They'll bring a legion in. And you won't have the freedom you've got. We will not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly and everyone went away. The problem's not over, but this day is ended. When, chapter 20, verse 1, when the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples, the believers, and after encouraging them, said goodbye and set off for Macedonia. Paul's out of town. He leaves town and heads to Macedonia, which is up north to Philippi, Thessalonica, and is on his way to Corinth to deal with the problem there. Uh, and that's where you get 2 Corinthians from. That, that time in Macedonia, he writes a, a, what we call 2 Corinthians down to the letter to the Corinthians. It would actually be his fourth letter to the Corinthians. We call it 2 Corinthians because we've only got 
number two and number four, one and two, we call them. He traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement in the land of Macedonia uh, to the people, and finally arrived at Greece, or Achaia, which is where Corinth is at, where he stayed three months because the Jews made a plot against him just as he was about to sail for Syria. And then we're going to come back and pick this up probably, I guess, next week, when he, on his way to Jerusalem, he stops by Ephesus and says goodbye to the leaders and has a, a word for them. Now, what I want to do right now is, uh, and let me know how this looks, but this is some background on Ephesus, and this is a map right here. I got a lot of these pictures. I've added some things to this one. I've I got some drawings on this, but a lot of the pictures I'm going to show you come from Carl Rasmussen's site, Dr. Rasmussen, uh, Holy Land Photos. Uh, we went to Israel with him a couple of times. Uh, he asked several times to take us to these, these, uh, <coughs> the, the Asia Minor here. Uh, and, of course, situations developed with, you know, all the things the last few years that we haven't gone back. But it would be nice to go. But anyway, these are his pictures. Uh, this is a map that I kind of put together. But nonetheless, you can see right here, and I don't know if you can see that. Here is the Temple of Artemis sits here. Corinth, if you can see this, Corinth, excuse me, Ephesus, Ephesus was on the Aegean Sea. So here's the Aegean Sea, Aegean Sea. I think there's an E there. And this is the inland right here. These are the seven churches of Asia Minor right here. But there was a river, it wasn't on the coast right here, there's a river called the Castor River that came in like this. And then there was a harbor right here. And this is Ephesus. Ephesus is right there. So ships would come in the harbor or come in this Castor River that led to a harbor that then was highly developed by the Ephesians for the city. Uh, coming off of this, I'm going to show you, there's a roadway called the Acadian Way. It was a pillared roadway called the Harbor Road. Right here was a road called the Marble Road going this way. And then up here was another road that kind of turned and went up here. This is where the theater sits. Right here is the theater. Okay, that, those are seats in a theater. This was the Agora. This was uh, a, 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 as big as a football field. I mean, uh, it was 100 yards long and 100 yards. So it's more of a square instead of a football field. But it's huge as far as 100 yard by 100. And those are just rows of, of businesses and shops. Uh, the resident, there's some residential s sitting right here, some residences right there. And then as this went out and went up this way, there's some residences up here. Uh, the roads went up, and I'll show you all this in better detail. Up here, this was a hill, a, a kind of a mount actually rising up there. So this theater's built on the side of a hill. The house of the Roman governor is right there. Now we're talking across the street. This is where the silversmith worked, Agora. This is the theater where they started the riot. This is where the Roman governor lived. Right here are some bathhouses, right here. Uh, there's some gymnasiums in here, different temples, different places. But up here is the Temple of Artemis, is right here. Uh, and it's up on top of a hill going this way. So that's kind of where we're at, if that helps. So what we have here on this diagram, I, I hope this is interesting. Right here is the Temple of Artemis. You can see right up there. And then as you come down here, this is the harbor right here. Uh, well, excuse me, that, that's this part right here. Today, this is all silted in. This is all because of water, just all filled in. This is just kind of like a swampy area right here today. So if you go there, that's what it looks like. But you see the remains of these buildings. Here's the Acadia Street. goes up this way right to the theater. There's pillars on both sides. There's bathhouses here and other places. Uh, this is the theater. I'll show you some pictures of. Marble Street goes here and then... Uh, Curethus Street goes this way. Uh, here's the Agora where all the shops and all the silversmiths were working right there. So you look at a little close-up look like that right there. Uh, Katie Street Bass. That's him. I'm going to try to tell you a story. I'm not going to get to it today, but I'll tell you a story. One of the early Gnostics, Serinthus, uh, would come in right after Paul during this time. He'd been, uh, he'd been through Jerusalem, Israel. He'd been through uh, Galatia. Uh, but he was around here in, uh, in John's day, probably around 85, 90 A.D., while John the Apostle John is going to move to the city 
of Ephesus from Jerusalem, about 66 AD. John is going to bring Mary with him from Jerusalem. Mary and John are going to end their lives here. Now, John's going to live there for about 30 years. Mary, we're not sure when she died. They probably lived up here in this residential area up here. In fact, there's a, there's a, a church that is claimed to be the house that Mary lived in up here in the residential area. Again, I'm not sure. I've never been there to look at it. Um, but nonetheless, there's some baths everywhere. There's not everywhere. There's several bathhouses, but here's one of the main bathhouses right here, right here by the harbor. Anyway, uh, it was where, that's where publicly, that's what they did. They'd go there. That's where they would bathe. Uh, they didn't have necessarily like what we have, our nice Western personal houses and facilities that we have here. Um, but nonetheless, John was there with his disciples in the bathhouse, and he sees Serenthus. It's in some of the notes. You can read it. On the, it's on the back page of something, and I'll talk about it again. <clears throat> but when John sees Serenthus there, uh, he says to the effect, Serenthus, the, the, the enemy of God or the son of Satan is here. Let us get out of this building because God may judge Serenthus even while we're here because he was such a blasphemer. And so John leaves the bathhouse, and that's recorded by uh, a couple of church fathers from that time period talking about what John did. There's more stories about John, but none of that less, less. That's a story about John in the same community. Okay, let's keep moving. I got a lot of things to show you, and I'm down to nine minutes. Here is uh, the next one right here. This is the same map, but up here at the top, I've added to that right there. There's the Temple of Artemis right there. That's what it would have looked like sitting right there. We moved down like this. This is the, uh, the harbor Whoa, right here. There's the harbor out here. There's the uh, Arc Arcadia Road. The baths would have stood here. And I'll, bring, I'll zoom this out here right there so you can see kind of where that's at right there. There's the harbor, Acadia Road. There's the baths. There's a facility here. And then right here, the green box, that's the theater. And I'll bring that in right here like this. There's the theater sitting right there. And very important right here is this right here is the Agora. This part is right. I don't have it boxed off. That's the Agora where they would have been working. And again, that's 100 meters or 100 yards by 100 yards. And then uh, this is right here where Marble Street meets this other street. There's a library that was built in the second century that held about 12,000 books sitting right there. But that is a layout of the city of of uh, Ephesus. Again, the important point here is what we read in chapter 19. Paul was probably working here every day, then would go somewhere in a building and have lectures in Tyrenus' lecture hall during lunch, come back and continue working. He had such an effect on the city that the business that was taking place here, the silversmiths that were making the images or the trinkets and the shippers, the boxers, the packagers, the delivery guys, whatever, the, the, the shopkeepers, the whole market was the fact that they ended up in this riot right here. And right behind where the picture's covering up, that's where the governor's house is at. Here's some more pictures as I go through this. There is a picture of the theater. Can you see this at all? You're in the back row of the theater in the back, looking out towards the harbor. The harbor would be right here. You can't see it. It's all silted shut. There's Arcadia Road right there. The baths that we talked about, John being in when he condemned Serenthus and left. Uh, Arcadia Street. Oh, that's this one. This would be the Marble Street right here. And there's the Agora right over there. So this is, this is where the, the riot took place right through here. Continuing here very quickly. Here's the same thing. Now we're over here on this side of the theater looking down. Look how big the theater is. The theater was packed full, riding against Paul. The Agora over here where Paul, the artist, and the Sumpists were working, they just had to come across the Marble Road. The Marble Road goes right up this way, this way. And that's where the riot would have taken place. Is this interesting at all? Okay. All right, again, another picture of just a picture of the, uh, of the theater, which again, that's where the riot, that's where Acts 19 takes place. There, that, there's, I mean, you can argue if you want to, but it's like, okay, what, what are you going to take place at? You're going to just say it all made up or something. But nonetheless, now you're standing with your back, you're standing right about here looking this way. You got the agora, you see the pillars from the agora yet, the trees have grown up in the area. But there's this where Paul would have been working in here. And right over there is the theater where they met. The riot start here with Demetrius, the silversmith, one of the leaders. Take the crowd over here. Notice how it's built into Mount Pion right here. This is built into the mountain right there. There's a hill there. On this way, further up north, is the, uh, is, uh, uh, the Temple to Artemis. Now, this is the marble road going this way. That would be this road right here. We're going to come down to this corner right here and turn and go up this way out of the city a little bit here. 
Here is, again, a visual. There's a visual from the top of the theater. Here's the Acadian Road or the Harbor Road right here, the pillars. The bathhouse would be here. The harbor's back over here. It comes up, turns right, goes down the Marble Road, down here. And then we're going to turn a little bit left and go this way. Again, the theater. And again, it's obviously pretty impressive. Now, the Library of Celsus sits right here at this intersection. In fact, I've got Marble Street right here. This is where the Marble Street that runs in front of the theater, between the theater and the Agora, turns and goes on to this street, Coretta Street right here, and comes up this way and heads up here, which then will turn and go out to the residences. There are some residences and houses right here. I mean, we're, Paul, uh, Paul lived there somewhere. So Paul could have lived here, could have lived further out this way. So we're actually moving away from the Temple of Artemis up here. Now, we're up here on Coretta Street looking back at the Library of Celsus right here. You can see right there, that's the Library of Celsus. That held uh, something like 12, had 12,000 volumes in that right there. And if you look back here, there's the ancient harbor in the back, the Agora once again here, and that marble road theater would be sitting here <coughs> uh, this now is standing right in front of celsus library looking up the road going up and then the residence would be this way so you're standing right here looking this way again amazing i mean paul walked on these roads i mean say like, what well, do you think paul yes he walked on these every day i mean he if he lived out here he walked on this every day walked work he worked right here at the agora he wanted to go into the theater right over here where thousands of people had gathered to meet him Here's a visual of the top place right here if you want to look at this very quickly. There's the harbor, Acadian Road, the, the harbor bass. That's a gymnasium. That's a temple of to, to one of the emperors. Uh, there's another gymnasium. There's a stadium. There's the theater. There's the Roman governor mansion right there. That's where the Roman governor lived right there. They talk about making the governor upset. <laughs> you're working here. You're riding here. The governor lives there. Uh, you're going to call in the legions if you don't settle this down. You come up the marble street. Go up this road right here, Coretta Street. And out in here is where the, uh, there's a temple to Isis right here. Up in this area is where the, uh, there's another gym. I'm turning the page here again. What else we got? Uh, here's the same visual. If you look at it right there, coming out of the harbor, temple, Agora, Marble Road, Coretta's Road. Uh, there's the state Agora. That's different than the uh, community Agora, Celsus Library. Uh, there's there's uh, uh, the remains of the, the temple to uh, Julius Caesar. <coughs> Here's a monument that talks about good fortune. The silversmiths, talks about the silversmiths right here. This inscription from Ephesus was found in 1984 in the street that connects the theater with the stadium. So one of those, those streets that runs this way, the, th the, the stadium's up here, right here on this street. This is talking about the... Uh, the silversmiths of Ephesus that was found is written in 200 AD. Uh, here's another picture. Uh, we looked at that one already. Ah, here's a model of the Temple of Artemis. It doesn't exist anymore. Here's a coin with the Temple of Artemis on it. Uh, that would be the Temple of Artemis sitting right up here. That's what the riot was about. This is uh, 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 an inscription. One of the inscriptions on a pillar. Two columns have been rebuilt. Part of the uh, uh, one of the Pritaniums, one of the buildings there uh, inscribed on this column is from Acts 19. It says, some of the officials of the province were friends of Paul. This is a direct reference to that same name where they, their title that they gave them, the city officials. It's the same thing there that you see in Acts 19, 13 is on that pillar uh, from that time period. Ah, the steps of the Library of Celsus right here. Uh, in the steps a Jewish menorah is carved into the steps of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the library there, which is interesting that the Jews did that. Now, this is fun for me, and I'm done. I did this in 2014 for, we went through Acts chapter 19. This is Google Earth. A G, this is today. This is today, well, 10 years ago. Uh, this is the Castor River right here. It flows up this way. Right into here, you can see the harbor right there. See that, the harbor silted in. This is, uh, from Google Earth, this is Ephesus right there. There's the theater. There's the Acadian Road. 
There's the marble road. This is the one that goes up past the uh, library, up towards the residences. Paul would have lived out here, most likely. Up in here would be the uh, Temple of Artemis. There's the harbor. There's the bathhouse. Again, there's the Agora right there. That's uh, Google Earth. But in, here's, let me get it smaller. And thank you for your patience. Here it is again, a little bit closer. Now it's all labeled. Can you see that right there? It's all labeled right there. All those places. It's on your notes online there. And here it is again, more detailed. Harbor Road, theater. There you can see, the, there's the harbor today. It's, it's silted in, but you can still see the remains of it. And Library of Celsus, Caritas Road, Marble Road, theater, Agora. And there's the theater again, Marble Road. There's Agora, theater, uh, Marble Road. And what else we got? There it is again. Oh, this is the theater. Now you're going down the Marble Road, turning at the library and going up out into the residential area. Agora is right here where Paul would have worked. And this is going further up the Marble Road, uh, the library, up this road, the Caritas Road, and then out into this would be the res see, residences of the, of, of the common people. So there's a good chance, again, we, don't, we didn't find his address, Good chance Paul lived out in here. In fact, there is a, a, a church with dedicated to Mary that Mary lived out here. And that would make sense. Uh, again, I'm not sure how much evidence they've got of that. But Mary, Mary's buried here. Uh, nonetheless, that's the residence. And this is Ephesus. Oh, that means we're done. All right. Hey, I'll pray. We're done. Thank you for being here. Next week, we're going to look more at... Uh, after chapter 19, after this, Paul leaves, goes to Corinth, and then he sails by, and he meets with the leaders of all the churches and gives them a prophecy. Basically, says, look out. There's going to be people in your church rise up and lead people astray, and that's exactly what happens. And in 62 AD, he has to send Timothy here to put a stop to the very problem he saw already beginning when he was there in 57 AD. We'll look at that. And uh, again, we're laying a foundation for looking at the book of 1 Timothy. I appreciate you listening and being here. Uh, We'll see you next time. Father, we thank you again for the chance to look into these things. We ask that we would use them to our advantage, that we would be able to analyze our own lives, that we'd be able to choose correct doctrine and believe the, the, the facts that you presented to us, but also that we'd be able to manage ourselves and navigate our way through our own culture without blaspheming and, and, and ridiculing everything to be able to present Christ in a way that would overshine and lead people towards your glory. Father, we do ask that we again would present Christ to this generation in our lifestyle, in our words, in our doctrine. And let the pieces fall as they would, just as Paul did, presented Christ and, and changed the entire culture. Again, Father, we do thank you for this opportunity. We thank you that we are in Christ, that you've given us these truths, and that we have our names written in your, your book of life for all of eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.